All right, everybody. So thank you. Thank for your patience at the beginning as well as we worked out a few things. And thanks everybody for joining the sustainability webinar again this afternoon. As always, it'll be recorded. We're, we're doing that now. Please make sure you're on mute and either hold your questions till the end if you'd like to verbally say them or put them in the chat and we'll circle back like we usually do. Make sure we get those questions answered. Um, one more note about the series. This is the last scheduled webinar. We are trying to set up a couple of additional webinars. Those are the TBDs, natural infrastructure, and uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, deep energy retrofit. So if once we're able, we're again in conversations trying to finalize that. Once we get a final date, you guys will all be notified of that as well. Um, so we don't want to lose you. All right, uh, today we have a presentation entitled Standards Relating to Anti-Terrorism, Force Protection, Lateral Wind, Seism Seismic Activity, and Fire Performance from Mr. William Vase. Bill is a structural engineer in the USACE Protective Design Mandatory Center of Expertise located within the Omaha District. He has worked for the Corps almost 40 years and 22 of those years have been in the Protective Design Center where he is a senior engineer in the hardened structure section. Bill's work in protective design has focused on the areas of structural engineering, anti-terrorism, weapons and explosives, uh, effects and security engineering with an emphasis on windows, doors and glazed systems. His responsibilities in the protective design center include structural analysis, design of facilities to resist the effects of terrorist threats, as well as other aggressor tactics, design support, development of security criteria and specifications, and performing various studies and analyses. Prior to joining the Protective Design Center, he worked in both the Omaha District Design Branch and Special Projects Branch as a structural engineer on numerous mi military facility designs. Bill is also a registered pro professional engineer in the state of Nebraska. So with that, welcome Bill. I will turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. I appreciate that kind introduction, and I'm going to try to share my screen and hope that everybody is able to pick up uh, on the, the slide presentation. And it was sharing a moment ago. And is anybody there's usually it? a lag bill, so don't yeah, don't worry. There's usually a lag. It'll it'll probably show up in just a second. And if it doesn't, okay. like I said, I've got you up and I can. You can just next slide me. <laughs> okay, very good. Unless I'm. Yeah, should have been showing by now. It, it should have, I think. Um, let me see if it's. Um, oh, I get it. Maybe it's on one of these other windows. How about this one? Yes. And are you seeing uh, this one should be uh, just. Yes, the, sir. There you are. Okay. Wonderful. Yes, and, sir. Just the, just the title. Thank you. Uh, okay, great. All right, well, thanks. Welcome everybody. And I appreciate, uh, I wanna thank uh, Ms. Woods and uh, Mr. Sitzler for giving us the opportunity to give this webinar with you. And uh, I hope that this will be informative. It's gonna be a lot of information and I know it's a broad audience and I'm gonna do my best to, to give you a, hopefully a meaningful 45, 50 minutes of time and then about a 10 minute question answer at the end. So with that, uh, the title I've put on this slide anyway is basically innovative products for military construction projects, which was the uh, actual, the, uh, the title of the National Defense Authorization or uh, Appropriations Act section, that 2886, that discussed this this need for this webinar and this continuing education. So, uh, as Stephanie mentioned, the the curriculum elements that we're trying to address out of the five that were required have to do with standards and criteria that relates to anti-terrorism and force protection, uh, lateral wind loading on structures, and seismic activity. And then uh, joining with that would be the use of innovative and that would include, I would assume, a sustainable type building materials and construction methods. And that's kind of a, a lot of information in one place. But what my goal here basically is to give you a good understanding of the impacts on the structural design of a building for those kind of extreme loads. And then where do we fit right now with the push for innovative and sustainable materials methods uh, with what we can achieve right now with our state of the art 
uh, criteria right now in in structural engineering. So uh, with that, the uh, topics that I plan to cover in the next 45 to 50 minutes will actually go into discussion on the design criteria that applies when we are trying to design for wind, seismic and aneurysm or protection types of uh, threats against our, our buildings, our facilities. I'll spend a little bit of time discussing the uh, actual methods that we go about designing for those extreme events and the strategies that we have and how we want the building to respond. What are our goals at the end of our design with that criteria? And then uh, we'll talk a little bit about how that design impacts the overall project, especially meeting some of these extraordinary types of uh, threats and loads on a building are going to drive a lot of impact to other parts of the facility and cost and also what are the typical materials we use and then tie in at the end some information about some of the innovations and sustainability movements and, and principles that are out there and how we can achieve some of those but maybe not all with where we stand right now with what we know about structural engineering. Um, I want you to know kind of a caveat here. This, all three of these uh, loading conditions, wind, seismic, anti-terrorism, are extremely extensive fields. I mean, this is not something that takes 15, 20 minutes to develop. I'm gonna uh, give you a very brief, general 10,000 foot view overall of what what uh, is involved in these. Um, with the with the time limited 45 50 minute presentation it's going to be very difficult to give you a lot of really great in-depth so we're going to leave a lot of important topics kind of left unsaid and if there's structural engineers tuning in on this they're going to be disappointed because there's going to be like a it's going to make it sound like things are very simple when we deal with these kind of extraordinary events um nonetheless um We'll, we'll do my best to to give you kind of a, an overview and tie this all together with our, our main topics for the day. Um, last thing to mention here is that there's several references and information that I use to compile this particular webinar. It's great, but if it's, it's viewed in the future after this is recorded, I want everyone to recognize that all the information and references that I'm talking about were current as of the time that I generated this presentation, which would be July of 2024. So a lot of criteria changes rapidly in the field of uh, design. And so uh, some of this information may be out of date by the time this recording is reviewed or, or tuned into later. OK, so let's jump in right away on some of our criteria overall. You're looking at a list of the unified facilities criteria documents that go into basically the design of a, of a building and they're all governed by the very beginning at the top there by ufc 1 201 the dod building code that's the the you recognize building codes across the entire industry out there generally are governed by the international building code ibc and the international existing building code the DOD building code is used specifically by DOD, so we take that industry IBC, e IEBC document and through our building code, we correct or adjust or supplement or delete some of the criteria uh, in the international code to make it more DOD specific. So uh, there's a lot of things that govern what we can and cannot do when we are designing facilities. Uh, this list of UFCs, I don't know, there's probably 25 or so of those sitting there. And you can see they encompass all of the disciplines that it takes to give you a good, safe, occupiable building when everything's done. All the, the different design, architectural, and uh, engineering disciplines. The ones we're focusing in on for wind and seismic fall under the purview of UFC 3. 30101, that's the one over there on the left-hand side, about third from the bottom for structural engineering. And the anti-terrorism force protection exists in its own set of UFCs. That's over here in series four, 010, 
01, DOD minimum anti-terrorism standards for buildings. That's over there on the right-hand side, about third from the bottom. Uh, there's a lot to be said about that and some misunderstandings about the minimum standards I hope to help clear up in this presentation. So moving on then to first our wind design criteria. Again, I'm going to try and capture a very broad topic here in one slide, so please bear with me that that if you're an engineer and you're looking and you say, hey, Bill, what about this? Or you forgot to mention that. Yeah, I sure did because I've got a very brief amount of time to discuss something that probably ju justifiably, arguably could take three days to fully explain. So uh, uh, if it was a training seminar. So with wind, again, as I said, governing criteria comes from UFC 33101, the structural engineering. And further, comes from industry standards, ASCE 7, uh, the American Society of Civil Engineers joined with the Structural Engineer Institute to come up with a reference that we, they call number seven. So I'll hereby refer to it as just ASCE 7, uh, currently uh, being used as the 2016 version of that. And that document, that ASCE 7, sets minimum design loads that the structural engineers uh, and civil engineers can go into and gather all the data they're going to need to be able to develop the wind loading parameters that they need to design against. So uh, that, that third bullet basically is indicating that the engineer will go in and with that ASCE 7 reference specifically find parameters that are specific to the site at which this building is being constructed. That information, along with deciding the building risk category, and a risk category is defined as basically um, how much, what kind of occupancy the building has. Is it an essential building? Is it a low, inha slight inhabitant, low occupancy type building? Is it a facility that houses large numbers of people? or its mission is going to be critical post-disaster, like hospitals with emergency rooms and fire stations, or could it be a very, very high-risk category, which is involved in, concerns us in DOD with things like uh, necessary for uh, national defense and that sort of thing. So that risk category is very important, and as the category of the risk of the building itself goes up, the more intense the loadings are that we put on the building, that we then design to resist and make sure that we achieve our goals and keep that facility operational with, with less chance of it uh, being inoperable or uh, um, <clears throat> not available to us when we really need it. So uh, the basic things like that in this ASCE 7, the engineer will find the basic wind speeds. <coughs> Pardon me. There will be times where <coughs> excuse me, um, there may be maximum winds or very severe winds that need to be addressed too, like tornadic type winds or typhoon type winds or hurricane winds. So uh, uh, given the information about the directionality of the wind, uh, where the building is located, is it in the wide open or is it in urban areas where there is different exposure of, to the wind directions and speeds? Uh, things about the geographic topography around that, even the height of the building above sea level has something to do with wind density. So from all that information, the engineer will be able to determine the wind pressures that he's got to resist. And they will, those will be the ones that are depicted by the, the graphic in the lower left there, where the overall structure of the building will see wind on windward and leeward sides and on the roof that may cause uplift or downward pressures. And then they will also consider the wind pressures that are going to uh, uh, strike the components and cladding of the exterior envelope, roof and walls on the sides, higher areas at ridges and corners and things like that. So, and the loads can also be internal or external. So it generates a lot of information then that the engineer themselves can develop as the criteria that they need to design. So basically I'm showing here for, for purposes that I'm gonna come back to in just a minute, that the, this reference contains a lot of different maps of basic wind speeds or, or uh, extreme tornadic type winds, recurrence intervals, and that sort of thing, 
that are generated from historic data. And the engineer's got a reference that he can go in and specifically pick off information and generate the criteria themselves. Seismic design, similar situation. Um, the seismic criteria is governed still by the UFC 330101 structural engineering. Also, several chapters of ASCE 7 are dedicated to the seismic design criteria. And there's yet another uh, set of criteria that's followed uh, when we're dealing with how are we are going to develop the criteria again for existing buildings, exist existing federally owned buildings and leased. So there's a lot of information that the engineer has to delve through to properly develop the criteria. Um, along like wind, the, uh, the engineer himself or herself will be able to determine the seismic forces due to ground motion um, that I need to design my building and any other type of structure to resist. And developing those ground motion effects, uh, you have to look at a lot of very um, kind of uh, uh, technical information such as spectral response acceleration parameters. Uh, what about the soil? What about uh, areas are we near or far away from faults and that sort of thing? Uh, what is the geography and the site classification that leads to development of those ground motions, other seismic attributes. And the, another really important part is developing the fundamental period, that, that amount of time that it takes that building to sway through one cycle of movement and how that's going to interact with these extensive ground motions and accelerations that can happen in two tenths of a second or one, one full second. And those are extreme kind of loads that are on the building. Um, this criteria, again, very broadly, because of so many chapters involved and even methods of how to design, I'm really skipping a lot of information here. But one of the key points that the criteria does develop for the design of the building is assigns importance factors to the building that are going to be based also on that risk category. As I said, more important, uh, more risk involved means greater importance factors and also seismic design categories. Those, those two elements there tend to assist the engineer in deciding what type of seismic force resisting structural system he wants to use and height limitations. Do, do you wanna use a load bearing wall or do I need to build a structural skeleton and clad that with other materials? So there's a lot of information that's going in here as well. And bottom line, the ground motions um, often are assumed that they can occur in any horizontal direction. So that engineer is going to spend a lot of time with many different uh, situations of directions of force coming out of the building and uh, uh, how that affects irregularly shaped buildings. So it's all about deciding what forces they need to resist and how much displacement that force is going to create uh, horizontally. But we sometimes do consider vertical accelerations as well. Not always, not usually by themselves, but but that may come into play and be another uh, element if we've got overhanging cantilever like canopies or, or structures that have very long spans. Again, ASCE 7 contains a lot of different maps where a lot of information and uh, uh, a warning here is the maps are based on risk category and what type of earthquake you're considering. So the engineer has to be very careful in going in and selecting the correct information from these USGS seismic maps. So that's very critical. I don't mean to belittle and make it sound like this is as simple as picking a number off of a map somewhere, but what it does do is mean again, the engineer can develop their own criteria from all referencing this one source document, okay? Now, dealing with anti-terrorism force protection, that's different. We're, we're, we've got a different animal. We don't have just one source that the engineer can turn to, open a book and site specifically say, oh, these are the kind of aggressors we have there. These are the kind of threats and tactics that are being used in this location. So, Anti-terrorism criteria is is actually a different animal, and uh, I want to just add, mention real quick: there are two bits of criteria here. One is a set of minimum standards, UFC 41001, the DoD minimum anti-terrorism standards for buildings. 
they're all about just basically saying, here's baseline engineering standards you're going to put into an inhabited building. As a minimum, you'll do at least these things to protect people, okay? Or provide some protection to people. But there's also a criteria document, UFC 402001. That's the DOD Security Engineering Facilities Planning Manual. And that document is really meant to be used by a, a wide variety of uh, audience, not just engineers. Uh, it helps them plan the project to determine what types of security and anti-terrorism requirements do we need to apply to keep everyone and all of our assets in that building safe. So it, it determines something about the assets and a range of different threats that target them. So real quick question, show of hands. I know I don't have cameras on, but just humor me for a minute. I'm going to guess that the vast majority of people out here maybe have at least heard of UFC 41001, the minimum standards, the document on the left. But I'm going to also ask rhetorically, how many people have ever heard of the planning manual 42001 over here on the right? And from my experience in Protective Design Center, a lot of people know what the minimum standards are. Very few people know what the criteria document that goes with that, the planning manual is. The reason that I bring that up is a lot of people think if all I do is apply, I've seen a lot of scopes of work, a lot of uh, requests for proposals go out on projects that just say comply with the minimum standards with no other mention of any other security. And that is blatantly wrong. We should start always early on in every project over here with the planning manual, the upper left uh, document, the start here document. The reason you start there is after going through a procedure, you, that document actually leads you to know whether or not maybe those minimum anti-terrorism standards are perfectly fine, and that's all you need to worry about. In other words, we don't have anybody threatening us that we, pr we predict. We just need to put these baseline elements in there to do something for people in the building in the event that some kind of an attack happens. However, that planning manual may also tell you you need to do something way above and beyond those minimum standards. You may have something in this facility that has great worth, that is valuable uh, to Department of Defense. And it wouldn't necessarily mean that you might have people, of course, and you may have a lot of people that's more value, or you may have mission critical folks of greater value still, but you could have a lot of other things in a facility that needs some sort of protection that the minimum standards will do nothing to help with. Okay, so that's that's leading you down to the bottom where come up with the criteria that needs to be incorporated and then design that into the building. Okay, so that planning manual has a chapter in it that goes into how to develop this criteria. Here's the resource that the folks would turn to this chapter then to help develop the criteria I need for ATFP as opposed to what I did, went to the resource for wind and seismic. And because it's a procedure, there are some worksheets that are involved in that as well. And I'm going to talk about that just a little bit. Um, so let's start with the question of what exactly is security criteria. With wind and seismic, it was loads that are affecting the building. In security, we need to know two things. We need to know what level of protection I'm trying to give to those very valuable things inside my building. And I know need to know what threat they are exposed to. Okay, so this is going to translate into loads on the structure, but I don't know to what magnitude or what type until, and what kind of impact it has on the building until I know what protection I need to provide and what against what kind of threat tactic. Now, here's the big difference that I'm pointing out between wind, seismic, and ATFP. Wind and seismic, the engineer has a reference to turn to to develop his own criteria. Here, this criteria needs to come from someone other than the engineers. This is an installation or building user function to develop the criteria. They're the ones that know the most about their building. They're the ones that know what kind of valuable items and assets are going to be in that building. They also know the team that's that's organized will also have an idea of what kind of aggressors are in the area, what kind of terrorist threat we have, 
how capable are they? So this is a team effort that should be done at the installation level. The building user should be present. Intelligence folks uh, from that uh, discipline should be there. Anti-terrorism and security officers and master planning at the installation or specific to the building should be sitting down to go through this criteria to come up with a design threat and a level of protection. The engineers don't do this. It's dictated to them from this team, okay? And the outcome of a threat and a level of protection is basically quantified as uh, security criteria. So uh, it's a 10-step procedure. It sounds very ominous at first, but really the first seven steps are the ones that we need to accomplish. Very briefly, again, very broad subject. The PDC teaches a class on the use of this planning manual, and it's a five-day course. So to try and compress it down into a few slides, kind of difficult. But very quickly, the first worksheet deals with looking at and evaluating the asset in the building or assets. So one of these worksheets for each asset, people, equipment, uh, it's classified information, arms, ammo, explosive, um, monetary things, pilferable items, you name it, all the assets that DOD has may be in a building and we need to assess their value. So it's done by looking at five value rating factors like the criticality of the element. It's uh, If it's compromised, what's the impact on our national defense big picture? How quickly can we replace it? Uh, what kind of it, uh, publicity does it get if it is compromised? Um, bad publicity, does it make the people in the United States fear that our, our DOD is insufficient or not can't protect our information so we can't protect our country, right? Those kind, of, those kind of things. And then the value of it itself. Bottom line, there's a procedure that takes place. I don't need to describe that. But the final outcome is a scaled uh, subject, subjective value on a scale of zero to one. The lower end of that spectrum, it's of less value. If you're all the way up at a one, it's a very high value asset. And that, by knowing that value, gives us some information on the amount of protection I should provide for that. The other part of that uh, a worksheet discusses about the aggressors, four different types, criminal groups, protesters, terrorists, and subversives. We go through 14 different rating factors that split out uh, something about the asset, what makes it attractive that's likely to draw an aggressor to want to attack it. Uh, what about deterrence? If an aggressor is deterred, uh, we build in some deterrence. They're not as likely to target our facility or our asset. And then the best way to predict is historically, what have we seen in the past with criminal activity or what are the intentions of terrorists to, to a target? Uh, again, the process is done, ratings are applied, we do some division, and again, the outcome of this is how likely on a scale of zero to one is an aggressor to target this particular valuable people thing in my building. Um, that informs us on how likely an attack may be, and then that also informs us on how severe the threat may be. After that first part, there, we come to a decision point. Uh, if if we find that we are our asset value and our aggressive the likelihood ratings are on the low end of that zero to one spectrum, let's say less than or equal to a 0.5, then basically we're saying they either are of no interest, their, their value is probably low enough that no one is interested in targeting them, they're going to go after something more valuable, or the likelihood is so low that there's just nobody considering uh, attacking and so we'd consider that kind of a no threat environment and therefore we would apply only the minimum standards or whatever regulations apply. If there's arms, ammo, and explosives stored in a vault, then we're going to meet those regulatory requirements on how to construct that vault. On the other hand, if those rating factors start to fall on the high end of the spectrum, greater than a half point up to a one point, now we have one more worksheet to go through that's going to determine for us any number of different tactics. We've got 13 different tactics that we're worried about. Um, things like explosives, hand-delivered explosives, vehicle-borne explosives, people shooting at us, people shooting mortars or rockets at us, 
airborne and waterborne contaminants trying to poison us and can kill us. So those different tactics are considered. And then based on who's likely to carry them out and their capabilities, we're able to come up with knowing what kind of things we need to defend against and how severe they are. Explosives, weapons, tools, uh, contaminants. And that outcome then basically gives us a DBT, a design basis threat. That's the most severe threat in a given tactic that we will use that becomes the basis of our design of the building to resist it. And the amount of resistance that we're building in will be this level of protection. And that's protection is justified by the assets value. In this graphic, the, the higher the amount of protection we provide, the lower the risk acceptance we have over on the vertical axis. At the other end, if the value of the asset is not that great, easily replaceable, no big impacts, then we can accept a lot more risk and have a lower level of protection. So the value of the asset really drives the big impact there. Those letter designators, there's a, a document that it translates those, those, those different levels of threat, low, medium, high, uh, into real life explosive weapons that we'd have to design against. Okay, um, given that I've got a lot of slides, I'm gonna speed up just a little bit to kind of cover very briefly the minimum standards here. Uh, again, this is what a lot of people believe. I hear that the only thing they need to do is provide these minimum standards. Um, I mentioned already that they are just baseline minimum things to do, but they're only really applicable and meant to be used when we do not have a threat DBT or a level of protection LOP identified by that procedure I just described. So this is when they're most applicable. Otherwise, if we've got a threat, we should be doing something more. Recognize that the minimum standards are focused only on protecting people. If there are other assets in the building, what you do by these minimum standards, it may not be appropriate protection for anything else in the building that's of value. They're not really designed to do anything. They, re they are not designed, but they are things that are engineering principles that will help reduce mass casualties or their severity. We recognize that there will be collateral damage to the building at these minimum standards, but it's only damage that we're receiving as long as they're not targeting our building. In other words, if some other nearby building is attacked, our building is going to suffer collateral damage, but we will not have a mass casualty event in it. Okay. They apply to, again, DOD buildings that house people, 11 or more, with a certain population density. And there are exceptions to parts of the building that may not have enough density in them that we don't have to do that. The minimum standards will apply to new construction that are that's inhabited and meets this applicability, but it only applies to some existing buildings when you trigger it. And I don't have time to go into all those triggers, but just so, whoop, I apologize. Uh, there are some triggers that, that force you to do minimum standards. The strategies, again, we're trying to reduce hazard to people inside, try to limit how much airborne contamination gets in there and give people a mass notification system that says in the event of a threat, this is the proper type of action you should take inside this building to help protect yourself. Um, remember that the minimum standards are not based on a specific threat against my building. We, it's just some unknown, if there's an explosive threat nearby, I'm going to suffer some collateral damage, but not enough to kill everybody. There could be a mail or supplies bomb mailed to my building, but again, we're not designing specifically for it. We're just making sure that it is somewhere distant in the building away from where large population is. And if there's an airborne kind of contaminant biological or radiological release, we're going to make sure that we reduce how much of it gets into the building or spreads around. That's all the more the strategies are. <clears throat> so all the standards themselves, the 21 standards exist in chapter three of UFC 41001. And what you're seeing here is the title of each of the standards. Uh, in parentheses behind that, there is either an N representing that these standards apply only to new construction. 
standards that are uh, have a suffix of B in parentheses. Basically, those say that these standards apply to both new and existing. So all 21 apply to new, but only certain ones apply to existing, and that would be the ones that are uh, uh, followed by a B. So standoff distances, unobstructed space has to do with explosives, but, but the way the standards apply now, there's very limited amount of standoff. We no longer require vehicles to be parked a certain distance away from the building. That changed in 2018 when these documents are different. The only standoff we really recognize now will be from a new building out to the installation perimeter. OK, uh, I'm afraid I don't have time to go through each one of these. Again, this is part of our class and it takes a week to get through. But uh, uh, one thing I do want to point out is uh, standard number six having to do with progressive collapse, and that has that standard has been removed from in the last change, uh, UFC 41001. However, it's not eliminated. It is now under the purview of the structural engineering group and working group and is accounted for and dealt with in UFC 42303, which is design of facilities to resist progressive collapse. So it's not, we're not ignoring it. It's still out there. It still exists, but you'll turn to a different location to determine when or it does or does not apply. So anyway, those those are the standards that exist. Uh, one last thought before I move on from standards, uh, I want to keep you informed. Bottom line, transparency here, the standards are prescriptive, OK? There is no engineering. There isn't a design involved in any of the components, the windows, the doors, the walls, anything like that, that have a specific blast resistance, OK? They're only intended to reduce the amount of collateral damage our building would experience when we aren't the targeted building. So we might be OK. Uh, we might get the kind of damage that you see in the lower left photograph if the bomb is far enough away or they're not targeting us. But if the bomb is closer to some other building or they do actually target our facility, we may not be OK and we might experience a much greater amount of damage from uh, the blast like you see in the lower right area. Again, the minimum standards aren't designed for blast. It's kind of a risk acceptance. So uh, if you don't do the planning process that I showed you above and identify when there is a threat and a level of protection, you may or may not have any kind of protection if you end up being targeted. So very important that we start with that process. OK. Going to take a moment here. I'm watching my clock. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some design methods and strategies. Uh, again, wind, seismic, and blast all can create very severe loads on the building, and they're usually combined with gravity loads so that we get the governing types of loads that the designer should design for. Uh, the greatest gravity load or uh, uh, snow load, rain load, plus uh, strong wind. We want to make sure the building resists that. So with wind, we apply it as a static load. We use conventional design methods. And then we want to make sure that when we're done at the design of this facility, all the components in that building have enough capacity to exceed that severe wind load, lateral load on my building. With seismic, it's more involved. There is a greater amount of design that's involved and different methods. Often it requires some kind of linear dynamic modeling to make sure the building is sufficient, or there are some more simplified equivalent static load forces that you can apply in methodologies. Either way, bottom line, you, it's with seismic, there's a lot of enhanced detailing that must be done to make sure all the components uh, are connected well together and will resist those severe strong ground motions as a system. And there will be enhanced material requirements as well. Uh, greater special inspection, making sure that all of our materials are up to the best grades and strengths that we need to resist this very severe loading. Um, bottom line, the strategy, make sure we've got enough strength in our building, but that it can absorb energy and dissipate it from this ground motion to make sure 
that we allow the building to drift and move and some damage in some situations, but not collapsing and keeping people and property inside safe. For the ATFP design methodologies and strategies, again, if we assume low value items and no threat, the AT minimum standards apply, and you just simply comply with 21 prescriptive standards and you get what you get. However, if we've identified a threat and a level of protection that's required, that's there uh, could be a lot of different tactics involved. As I said, direct fire weapons, hand-delivered explosives, uh, airborne contaminants, uh, rockets, mortars. Um, we're going to focus mostly on those that are explosive in nature, but each of those would have an impact on the construction and structure of the building. So usually if it's our buildings have people in them, so we're usually targeted by terrorists. That's their mode of operation is to kill people. Therefore, blast usually is considered and has one of the greatest impacts on the design in the building. So uh, we'll talk about that for just a minute. Um, as I mentioned before, um, this is going to be a little bit different for people when we start talking about ATFP, because when we design our strategy here is to accept damage and various amounts of damage. For seismic and wind, we seismic we accept some damage, but but we want to make sure that we've got a very limited amount that the people are going to be able to survive and escape the building. With ATFP, we may be accepting even greater amounts of damage. So, um, as I said, we don't have any one reference to point to and know exactly what type of tactic and threat and how severe it is in some specific location. So the threat of terrorism and blast is, is unpredictable. It's certainly possible it may occur in the life of our building, but it may also be equally possible that it may never happen. That's one of the reasons we're willing to accept some risk because of that possibly low probability. Uh, another item to keep in mind that we, uh, we always design first for the conventional environmental loads, wind and seismic, get a member, and then we check that member against these extraordinary blast loads to see how they resist. And if we cannot make the conventional designed building resist adequately, then we have to do some enhancement. And that's where it starts to impact us cost-wise and, and construction-wise. Uh, know that this graphic on the bottom is basically saying an explosion creates some extraordinary loads, but they happen in extremely short duration. Um, in a blink of an eye, right? But in fact, they happen in even much less than a blink of an eye, in milliseconds, thousands of a second that that blast load occurs. And the units of it are pounds per square inch as opposed to pounds per square foot. So even one pound per square inch blast load would equate to 144 pounds per square foot. OK, so those are pretty extraordinary loads. And recognize that many of our blast loads are anywhere from five to 10 to even more pounds per square inch. So you could be looking at loads on your building that would be 1400 pounds per square foot. So extraordinary type loads. Bottom line, because of this strange probability and these extreme loads, we just can't make every building a fortress that will be remain undamaged. We've got to accept some damage and some risk. Um, I, I, I will kind of forego this slide a little bit. I had thought I'd have a little more time to be able to describe, but I'm burning through it pretty quickly. Uh, and I want to get to the last parts of this presentation. Uh, very quickly, we model blast design using a single degree of freedom method. We convert real systems into an equivalent spring and mass type of structure. Bottom line, when we use this method, it gives us this deflection. So this photograph on the right hand side, you're looking at a, uh, a concrete column that's been exposed to blast and it's curving there to the left. The yellow line to the right vertical plumb, that's the original position. The arched lot yellow line to the left of that represents its final position or its deflection. And that's what we're modeling is 
from its original position to after the blast event, there are large amounts of deflection that occur there. And we absorb energy by the way we design this building uh, and the elements to absorb that. That's what this lower graph in the bottom is representing, that we are using a lot of energy that occurs by damaging the element and letting it strain and absorb that energy. So that's why we're accepting damage in, in blast. Um, that damage is, uh, it's kind of, it's kind of ironic that the very thing that we put around us to protect us from blast is the same thing that generates the risk and hazard of things that can kill or injure us. So, as the value of the asset gets greater, it means we have to accept less damage. And deflection of an element is equal to damage. That damage turns into hazardous flying debris. So our goal is to control that amount of hazard. There's different levels and some of the representative kind of damage you might expect to see at these different levels of protection is shown in a photograph here. Where, and again, high caveat, that's that's in DC, Washington, DC. Not to say that that building is designed for high level of protection, but it does represent very robust type of construction and high level of protection means there's only superficial damage. So that building is, you know, in a would take a lot of design to be able to resist these uh, critical loads. Okay, last to uh, second to last topic has to do with project impacts and materials. After that, when loading is designed and its uh, uh, goal of limiting uh, deformations, um, the wind is designed so that it responds elastically. It flexes with the wind, but it hasn't permanent deformation. And so we can achieve that with most construction materials that are out there that are allowed by the building code. For seismic, now we are allowing the building to move and drift, even different drift between different stories. And we wanna make sure that it always provides a life safety importance. It's damaged, but it's, uh, it allows egress. So there is inelastic or plastic behavior where damage is expected um, and accepted, but there's always some residual strength there to keep the building from falling. In ATFP, we are, allowing even greater damage than what we would see there. Seismic, again, can usually be met with typical construction materials that are allowed by the code, but they just require additional uh, detailing and other requirements. So with ATFP, our impacts usually have to do an impact site work, site distance. One of the things that works best to resist blast load is a lot of standoff distance. So if we can solve the problem by keeping the bomb a long way away from our building, that's ideal. If the standoff is not available to us or we're on a constricted site, we're going to have to put in enhanced construction, which means uh, thickening up members, adding more mass, more uh, reinforcement and things like that. And that very quickly can add up to a lot of expense because not just the walls need to be blast resistant, but the roof does too, and the windows and the doors. So those expenses can rise very quickly in that situation. For ATFP, our typical materials that things, like I said, mass is inherently good and things that are ductile. So, uh, and they have a plastic or after they yield uh, uh, have behavior, that means we're, we love to use large, you know, structural steel reinforced concrete, reinforced masonry, steel studs that we add brick uh, veneer to for mass. Um, and again, a lot of detailing is necessary to make them be able to stay in place. Lumber, it is possible to use that in blast for usual stick built dimension type lumber, but it is a little bit unpredictable after it yields, it fractures and also, um, different species of wood respond differently to blast. So we can use it, but uh, it's it. we prefer to go with the other more robust types of construction. Okay, lastly, we'll talk a little bit about innovation and sustainability, and I still hope to give everybody a chance to uh, address some questions if needed. 
But right now, uh, there, there obviously is a big push for using mass timber. And what I mean by that is this is more than just dimensional lumber. It's, it's not two by fours, two by sixes, and that sort of thing. It can be rough cut large pieces of wood, uh, but it can also be a multitude of engineered wood products. And I have a number of uh, acronyms or letter designators there of them. Uh, cross laminated timber, CLT, glue laminated timber, um, GLT, nail laminated, several pieces of dimension lumber that is either glued or nailed together, and all sorts of other laminated veneers or laminated um, uh, uh, fibers, directional uh, layers in, in plywood and those kind of things. Those are all engineered wood products, and there's been a lot of advancements. They're very attractive to use those kind of mass timber elements, a lot of aesthetic value to them and good thermal. The only drawback is, as I said, because of the variability in the previous slide to wood and species and their reactions, we have to have a lot of testing and validation to verify that our modeling and how they're going to respond to a blast or a seismic or a wind load has to be completed. Specifically for blast at this point, only the cross laminated timber has had sufficient testing and study for to be able to be used effectively for blast resistance. OK, however, uh, we do have guidance on that in the protective design with a technical report. But keep in mind, even then, still, the CLT does still have some seismic issues. So it may not be the pan uh, uh, panacea that's going to be used anywhere in mass timber needs um, and be able to meet the seismic and um, uh, um, blast requirements. And there's a sketch of cross laminated timber. Basically what happens is imagine those as two by fours and the first layer, the two by fours are laid down running left and right. On top of that, we take another set of two by fours, run them uh, north, south, east, west, north, south, east, west in each successive layer. So we're building up layers of timber. These, these elements could be uh, two, three, five, seven layers thick. So these could be elements that add up to anywhere from seven to 10 inches in thickness and used as panels, usually on the exterior of the building. Again, only the cross laminated version of mass timber right now do we feel confident to resist blast. There's a lot of other sustainability initiatives, things like uh, are being explored, reduce carbon, reduce carbon concrete, reduce carbon steel, glass, other types of recycled materials being used, uh, stay in place formwork, uh, those kind of things. But again, each one of these new initiatives will require research and testing uh, and evidence to verify that they're able to seismically stand up to ground motion and resist blast loading. Right now, right now, the approach is if only the minimum standards apply. In other words, we have no identified blast load or level of protection, the, those kind of other mass timber products could be used potentially as long as they meet all of the structural building codes and design guidance that's out there, if it's allowed, okay? But, but if that building is gonna be exposed to blast, I would recommend that you do not use any of the other mass timber categories other than cross laminated timber. Um, very brief touch here on membrane structures or fabric covered. I know it's a very touchy subject right now with uh, a lot of the, the military departments, uh, NAFAC and AFKEC maybe aren't too pleased with that. The uh, Corps of Engineers, uh, we're not, uh, we're, we're, it's a touchy subject to, to some extent for us as well. Uh, generally, Fabric covered structures are prohibited in windborne regions, but there are places, very low category risk buildings where they could possibly be used, but usually we prefer not. They are vulnerable to flying debris that could 
break the fabric, tear through the fabric and and cause a risk to life and value high value assets inside. Even if the frame holding them up remains, they still expose elements inside to risk. If we are considering membrane fabric covered buildings in other areas outside of these extreme wind or windborne areas, uh, and only the minimum standards apply, again, I guess we would allow them because there's no threat of a blast or need for level of protection. As long as they comply with 21 standards, it's still just accepting the risk of collateral damage. But if a level of protection and a threat were, be, were de defined and identified, I would strongly recommend you don't use fabric covered buildings. Uh, largely, there's a lot of unmitigated hazard. The blast effects may just propagate right through that fabric. And not only would the people inside the building be exposed to the blast overpressures, but they might also have other elements in that fabric building that would be thrown or propelled at them. So we can't predict what kind of protection you get out of a fabric covered building right now. So we recommend they not be used if you've got um, uh, uh, threats. Last uh, last item I wanted to point is the, uh, the innovation of using 3D printed concrete, additively constructed concrete, ACC. That's a, a big push. I know a lot of people are looking at that right now. Um, it's had some limited blast and ballistic tests. Uh, we don't we don't know what its seismic performance is going to do. That's unknown. Um, so we aren't really pushing this or endorsing uh, 3D printed concrete, but we are working on it and trying to find ways to help identify. It sounds like a great initiative, but we want to make sure we know what we're getting into to be able to resist blast loads and seismic loads before we do that. So um, the uh, structural engineering UFC would allow 3D printed concrete in some very limited situations. First, you have to be approved with the authority having jurisdiction in writing that they will allow the use of this. And then there's a whole lot of information you'll see there that those structures have to comply with a lot of different requirements below. I've only listed five of them there. There must be more than a dozen uh, requirements that have to be met. And one of the key things to keep in mind is at the bottom bullet there, the pleth there's just a, per a plethora of a third party independent testing that has to be done on these materials before you can accept their use in just normal construction. Again, minimum standards, if that's applied, there's no threat. I could see ACC being used uh, in some material and very low inhabitants or low risk buildings. But if there is a DBT uh, threat and a level of protection defined, we would strongly, again, not recommend not using uh, 3D printed, we don't know what kind of hazard risk there is. And as I mentioned already, there's not enough testing, enough SDUF validation or prediction allowed yet uh, to achieve known protection against blast. And um, its seismic performance is unknown. So uh, just, to, just to, to, to wrap everything up, I, I would just like to say uh, within Department of Defense, you know, our modern construction that we've got it really, we can blend good aesthetics as you're seeing, we can blend in innovation products and sustainability uh, and those principles into the design of the building and still provide you know, good structural and protective elements. But the problem we have is the pace of, of these great ideas and initiatives and concepts, the pace of them coming out exceeds the pace of the science and technology and study that's necessary to make sure that we can give you a final design product that that meets all those innovative and sustainability goals, but also still safely resist some of these really extreme loads of wind, seismic, and blast. Um, bottom line, we're working on it. We're doing our best to incorporate them as we can, and uh, it's just going to take time and, unfortunately, a lot of money. And by we, I mean that the Department of Defense, NAFAC. Uh, AFCAC and, and the Corps of Engineers are all working together to, to try and increase that. So that, that wraps up my presentation. 
I'm sorry I didn't leave a whole lot of time, but if there's any questions or answers, I would do my very best to try and, and answer that for you. Hey, Bill, we do have uh, do have a question. There was a question initially about the EFC for progressive collapse. To, so thank you, Ms. Hodge and Ms. McBride. I appreciate the you guys got it in the chat before I did. So thank you so much for that there. But Bill did have a follow up question. Uh, we talked about mass timber quite a bit. Do you have any comments on the use of heavy timber? Uh, right, so that would be one of those elements where we're looking at like very large rough cut types of it for folks. What that means uh, heavy timber would still fall in the same category of we don't have, uh, we don't know enough about dimension lumber with its, uh, how it responds, but for the very large heavy timbers and that sort of thing, I would, I would say you could potentially build a, a single degree of freedom model for those larger dimensions, but again, you'd still be making some assumptions on extreme fiber failure and exactly how ductile they're going to be at what limit. Um, I think what we would see more likely to be the biggest problem in heavy timber construction would be the fact that those are very stiff, very robust elements that are going to transmit a lot of very rapid dynamic um, equivalent reaction to their connections. And I think that would be the biggest problematic situation would be properly designing very heavy con connections at the end of those big heavy timbers to be able to keep them in place and allow still some damage and rotation to occur. Well, that makes sense. Absolutely. Uh, that's all for the chat. Anybody else have any questions? Just unmute and go ahead and ask. Okay, not hearing any. Um, thank you so much, Bill. Appreciate your time. That was a, I, I got a lot out of the presentation. I'm sure other folks did too. So thank you. Thank you very much. And the recording uh, will be up as soon as I can get it up. So it, <laughs> at least by tomorrow, I would say that the, the recording and the slides and everything will be up. So give me time for that. But otherwise, thank you very much. Thank you for your time. We appreciate it and have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much, Stephanie. I appreciate this opportunity.